woman found lying in the snow outside a church in South Lanarkshire froze to death. The woman was alive when she was discovered by the church organist on a path in the grounds of St. John's Church on a Sunday morning. She was taken to Wyshaw General Hospital but died a short time later. Police said there did not appear to be any suspicious circumstances. It, it is understood the woman who was in her 30s had hypothermia. Police said a post-mortem examination had taken place. The church organist was on her way to prepare for the Sunday service when she discovered the woman who is believed to have been partially clothed. The Reverend Roy Cowis and the minister of St. John said, when we heard that the lady had died, we were extremely sorry that something like that would happen in Carluke and outside the church. The church canceled its 11 o'clock service on Sunday. Count, City Councilor Eileen Logan, who lives in the town, said, obviously the community is quite shocked and saddened. What is it about this story that sticks out to you? I mean, there are people that die every day, right? I mean, right? Am I right on that? And there are people that live on the streets that have little to no clothing, even in Heron, Illinois. And it might shock us a little if something like this were to happen on our church campus. But it's not the death that strikes me. It's not even the place that it happened. It is actually the response of the people. In particular, the pastor in the story. I mean, is his concern the person or is it the problem that somebody died on their church campus? I think sometimes we see the problem without seeing the person. Last week, we had an awesome opportunity to spend some time praying for our leaders as we enter into this year. And, and I just want to take a second and say this. Thank you to everyone who participated. Um, I believe that this was the first step in us coming together as a body and moving towards Christ and his mission for us as one, the body. Today, we're going to be talking about the first of our core values of a church. We have three but before we jump in, I just want to ask us, um, I just want you to, to join me as we ask God to teach us some things over the next few minutes. So if you would, please pray with me. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for all that you've done. God, we just pray today that you would speak to us. You would teach us. God, that we would hear the truth from your word. God, thank you so much for loving us the way that you do. God, may you be honored. We love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So as a church, if you've been here very long, we spend a lot of time talking about what our mission is and what we need to do to fulfill it. And especially at the beginning of the year, we want to take some time to remind ourselves what those are and how we can fulfill our mission in our community. So is there anybody in here that can tell me what our three core values are as a church? Huh? Say it really loud. Okay. Reach, connect, serve. That's who we are as a church. And, and the thing is, is we believe that those core values is what makes us special to God's body. Okay? Um, so as we base these three things, reach, connect, and serve, on two specific scriptures, okay? Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40, and Matthew 28, 18 through 20. These are not going to be up on your screen. If you want to know what they are, I will say them again, and you can write them down. Matthew 25, 31 to 40, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. In Matthew 25, it's probably going to be one of those scriptures that's a little less familiar to some people because it's not used a whole lot, even though I believe that it should be. But within Matthew 25, Jesus tells us that there are some things that we are called to do as followers. He tells us that we are to feed the hungry. He tells us that we are to give drinks to the thirsty. He tells us that we are to clothe the naked. He tells us that we are to visit prisoners in prison. He tells us that we are to visit the sick and afflicted. And along with this section of scripture, <clears throat> in Matthew 28, we're given what is most commonly referred to as the Great Commission. In it, we find our specific marching orders. And I shared it with you at the beginning of the service, and I want to share it with you again. Matthew 28 says this, verse 18. He says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
This is Jesus speaking. So he says, all authority has been given to me. So go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. Here's the thing about Matthew 28 that I really like about that section of scripture. It's that he actually tells us that the church, as a church, it's not our job to come sit in a seat on Sunday morning. There's actually action involved with being a follower of Christ. He says, go. And actually, we're not going to get real deep into this, but that word go actually is telling us that as you are going, throughout your day, as you are going, tell people about who I am. That's actually from Deuteronomy, but we aren't going to get into that real deep today. If you have questions you'd like to talk about that, I'd love to. So as you can see, Jesus has given us some pretty specific guidelines to follow as we work together as his church. So we believe that God has given us these three core values to push us so that we can strive to be better for his kingdom. They are to reach, connect, and serve. And that's all understandable, but I want us to take a minute today and I want us to zero in on a specific aspect of reaching okay the bigger question is this or we can all agree that we should reach correct I mean that's our job we all agree right yes no maybe sorta I'm still tired it's snowy and rainy we all agree that we are called to reach but the bigger question is who are we supposed to reach Now, I know that you could respond with a very simple church answer. And so if I asked you, who are we supposed to reach? Your response would be, everyone, which is right. But I think that there's actually more specifics that we can get when it comes to this idea of reaching. So today I want us to talk about three specific groups of people that scripture tells us we should be reaching with the love of Jesus. So... If you have your Bibles and you have your bulletins, I want you to be writing these things down because it's very important that we understand what our goal and our mission is as a church, okay? So the first group that we're to be reaching is a group that is most commonly referred to as the lost. Now, I, I want to say this, okay? That, that idea carries with it a lot of negative connotation when it comes out. It's not meant to be negative, all right? Understand that up front. But I want us to take a look at who this group is. When we're talking about the lost, we're actually speaking about a group of people who have never been introduced to Jesus. So it's not necessarily us being rude and hateful. It's actually a pretty good definition. It's someone who hasn't been introduced to who Jesus is. Now, I know that many of us would probably believe that living in Heron, Illinois, or the surrounding area, that most people around here know who Jesus is. Would that be a pretty good assumption? Yes. I'm here to tell you today that we shouldn't assume too much. And we'll get to that here in a minute. I want you to think about this, okay? Think about a lost child. Have anybody, any of you ever been to Walmart or Target or Kroger or anywhere and your child wanders off have you ever had that happen before just raise your hand i'm not going to call dcfs i promise we've all been there right my friend tim from up in the chicagoland area tells a story about his daughter in his book life on mission and and he tells a story about rachel and they were in florida on the beach and they're having a good time and all of a sudden they look up and rachel's gone she's three And they've been playing, and so they kind of start to freak out a little bit. And so they they decide that what the mom's going to go this way and dad's going to go this way. And so dad's running down the beach, and he's asking people, have you seen a little girl, three years old, in a pink Barbie bathing suit? Have you seen her? She's lost. Well, he ends the story by telling that when they find her, he doesn't freak out, which, man, good for him. I think I would. He doesn't freak out. Because the truth is, is Rachel didn't know she was lost. She just thought she was playing on the beach and finding seashells and having a good time. See, here's the thing. Oftentimes people don't realize they're lost. So it's our job to share that with them. Okay? They usually don't know that they're lost until we tell them. 
And this is the same for people who have never heard of Jesus. Now understand this. Most people think that they have heard of Jesus. Agreed? I mean, we live in America. All right, get on Facebook. And how many different strains of Jesus are you going to get when you go on Facebook? I use the word strain because I believe it's kind of like a nasty infection. We hear so many negative things about who Jesus is in social media and on the TV and on the radio and in the grocery store and at the dinner table. See, oftentimes the Jesus that people think they know is not the Jesus of the Bible. Too often, because of outside influences, the Jesus the world hears about is judgmental and he's full of hate. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room have heard of the Jesus that is a judgment, judgmental, hateful Jesus? Anybody heard of him? Just raise your hand real high. Come on. We've all heard of that guy. Because oftentimes the problem is people will only tell you a part of the story. And while I believe that God has sent Jesus here to judge us as who we are for our sin, the truth is this, Jesus came to save us so that we would not have to be judged by our sin. We could be judged through the eyes of God, through Jesus' blood that he shed for us on the cross. We are not judged because of our sin. We are seen as followers of Christ if we've accepted him. When the truth is, Jesus loves us all and he wants a relationship with us. But because of the influence of society, people have never accepted the true Jesus. I want you to understand something today, okay? Jesus came with a very specific mission. I know some of you have been in here, have been in the military. And when you go on your mission, it is very specific about the job that you are supposed to do. Listen to what Luke chapter 19 says about Jesus when he was sent on his mission. It says, for the son of man came to what? Seek and to save the lost. That was his mission. And if we call ourselves Christians, which actually the word means Christ-like, if we call ourselves Christians, then what should our job be? to seek and save the lost. It is not us that saves them. It is the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. But we reach them and lead them to the foot of the cross. In Luke 15, Jesus tells three stories about three lost things. And many of you have probably heard this before in your life. He tells a story about a lost sheep. He tells a story about a lost coin. And he tells a story about a lost son. In the first story, the sheep is lost. So the shepherd of the sheep leave his 99 sheep behind to go find this one that is lost. And when he finds him, what does he do? Well, he picks him up and he carries him on his shoulder and he comes back rejoicing because the one that was lost has been found. Another piece of this story in Luke 15, Jesus tells a story about a widow and she loses one of her coins. She has others, but she loses one. So what does she do? She begins to tear her house apart to find the one lost coin. And when she finds it, what does she do? She rejoices because the one that was lost is found. And a little bit later in Luke 15, we have a story of a son that wanders off, leaves his father, takes his inheritance, and he goes and he gives everything up in wild living. But one day, he decides and he realizes that his father loves him more than anyone ever could. And he comes home. And when he comes home, his father is waiting to see him walk down the road. And he runs after him and he rejoices because his lost son has been found. Do you know what's the same in all of those stories? That when something lost is found, they rejoice and they celebrate because the lost thing has been brought back home. The truth is, is we were always meant to be in relationship with Jesus. But if we don't know him, then we're lost. And so let me tell you something. You know what happens when you come to Christ? There's a party in heaven. We rejoice together because the lost thing has been found. 
We should celebrate when something lost is found, whether it's a coin, a sheep, or a son. See, we should be reaching out to help introduce the lost to Jesus. That's our job. We're tasked with reaching them and showing them the true love of Jesus. I've had the opportunity to, in my lifetime to work with a few, um, with some drug and alcohol recovery programs. And it's astonishing to me the number of people that say they've reached out to the church in their time of need, they're seeking the truth, they're wanting to be found, and they're basically told this, once you get cleaned up, then we would welcome you. That is not what we're supposed to do. Listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 2. And as he reclined at his table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, I love that part, they're trying to get his disciples to turn on him. But Jesus hears what he said. And listen to what he says. He said, those who are well, well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. If you've been in this church very long, you've heard me say this again and again and again and again. And if you stick around very long, you're gonna hear me say this again and again and again and again. It is this, the church is here to be a hospital for sinners and not a country club for saints. That is what the church is about. The church, the, 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 this was Jesus' desire for the church. And I'm gonna tell you right now, as long as I live and breathe and I stand here as the lead minister of this church, this is who we will be. We will seek and save those who are lost. Because the truth is this, we are all broken and we are all in need of Jesus. We're all broken. The second group of people we should be reaching out to is the de-churched. Now, this is a weird word. No, I did not make this up. It is really real. This is a group that is actually very near and dear to my heart. Um, and it is actually one of the fastest growing groups of people in the United States right now. Let me just give you the definition of someone that is de-churched. This is the way it's defined. They were formerly either very somewhat or minimally active churchgoers, but have not attended a church service in the past six months, excluding a special event such as a wedding or a funeral. Okay? This part of the population is 34% of Americans. They would call themselves Christians, but would classify themselves as de-churched. So how does this happen? Now, let me ask you a question, okay? And we're going to have to be honest. Is everybody ready to be honest this morning? Everybody's like, I'm not so sure. Okay, but I need everybody to be honest, okay? How many of you in here either know someone or are someone who has been hurt by someone in the church in the past and has either considered leaving or has left a church over it? In other words, if you've ever been hurt by someone in the church and have left a church over it, raise your hand. Okay? A lot of people. And there's probably more than that. I would say that's about 40%. I know that this is a pretty pointed and personal question, but the thing is it's going to help us understand the G-churched a little bit better, okay? I do want to pause and say this. If you're one of those people that has left and ended up here in this church, we are so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. Because so often the people, the reason people leave churches is not because of Jesus, it's because of the people that call themselves Jesus followers who don't act like it. And there's a lot of hurt that can come. And I pray that this could be a place of healing and restoration and hope for you. See, here's the thing. If, if you are one of those people and you're here today and you raise your hand, you are outside the minority because the more common trend today is for the people to have left, to leave the church they were hurt in and stop attending altogether. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm a Christian, I just don't go to church? Or I'm a Christian, I just don't believe in Jesus' church. I mean, I've heard it. I hear it probably weekly. And the problem is, is that's not who we're supposed to be. 
See, we are called to reach those who have drifted or fallen away. Listen to what James chapter five said. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover over a multitude of sins. See, we should seek out those who have been hurt or disenfranchised by the church and show them that we can be and are different. The truth is, as many people need to see a different Jesus than the ones they've been introduced to in the past. Many people need to see a different Jesus than the ones that they've been introduced through or that churches have portrayed in the past. The truth is, is Jesus loves you and he loves me and he died for us. Remember last week we talked about this thing and, and you're gonna continue to hear this over the next few weeks. So often the reason that there's problems in the church is because we don't make the main thing the main thing. We make the minor things the main thing. Well, what's the main thing? I'm just gonna say it again. The main thing is this. Jesus came to save sinners of who I am the worst and the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Main thing. Everything else doesn't matter. The things we fight about so often, they don't matter. What matters is that Jesus came to seek and save the lost, of who each of us are lost. The last group of people that we are called to reach is one another. One another. Jesus spends a lot of time in the beginning of his ministry talking about one another, okay? There are actually 59 times in the New Testament where Jesus tells us to love one another, to serve one another, to be kind to one another, to support one another. And to me, if Jesus spent that much time talking about something, then we should probably pay attention, right? Or is it just me? I mean, if, if you're a child in your house, okay, and your parents tell you to do something 59 times, should you do it? Children, yes or no? They're like, man, I don't want to answer this because I know my parents have told me 4,082 times to clean my room and I don't want to do it. If your parents tell you to do something 59 times, don't you think you're probably going to pay attention? Well, it's not required, no. 59 is not the number, like twice should be it, but... So let me ask you this question. Who are the one another's? Who are the one another's? Well, the truth is that's really all of us, along with these groups of people. And the truth is, is some of us may fall into the lost. Some of us may fall into the de-churched. Some of us may fall into a group of, of people that are saved through Jesus. The truth is, is all of us are one another's. Paul tells us in Philippians, 2, 4, he says, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And this just carries on the same message of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Karina alluded to it a minute ago when she was up here leading. How many of you are here today and have had a burden or a struggle in your life in the last five years? Just raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are here today and you've had a burden or a struggle in your life the past two years? Raise your hand. How many of you are here today and you've had a burden or a struggle in your life in the past six months? How many of you are here today and you've had a struggle in your life in the past week? Just raise your hand. See, here's the thing. We are called to reach out to one another and support one another in our times of need Everyone in here has been through a struggle at some point in time in their life. And we are to hold one another up. Let me ask you a question this morning. Who is your 3 a.m. friend? Who's your 3 a.m. friend? Don't know what I mean by that? Who can you call day or night to help you and you know that they will be there no matter what? See, that's what the church is about. It's about us being there for one another. That is what we are supposed to be for each other. See, here's the thing. We're called to reach the lost. We're called to reach the de-churched. We're called to reach one another. And that is the command that has been given to us by Jesus himself. And as his church, this should be where we begin to focus our effort and our energy. 
This is the first step for us becoming the church that God has called us to be. But you're probably going to ask a question. How do we do this effectively? Paul gives a pretty, pretty good answer in 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Because I believe that this is an instruction that Paul gives us on how we are supposed to reach. All right, we're going to pick up in verse 19 and it says this. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Here's the truth. We must do all we can to reach those who need Jesus. So let me ask you real quick, who needs Jesus? Everyone. So we must do everything to reach everyone. And it may very well be you who needs reach today. I love Craig Groeschel. He's one of my favorite authors. He's a pastor of a church in, in Oklahoma. And he says this, and, and we've started to adopt some of these ideas in our church and our leadership. And this is what he says, in order to reach the people no one else is reaching, we must do the things no one else is doing. In order to reach the people no one else is reaching, we must do the things that no one else is doing. Can I just be honest with you for a minute? That's a little scary. It's a little outside the box. But the truth is, is if we believe Scripture is true, then what Craig Groeschel says lines up exactly with what Paul says. We got to do whatever it takes so that we might win some to the truth of who Jesus is. See, the bottom line is this. If we're going to reach the lost, de-churched, and one another, we must be willing to be like Jesus in all we do. Can I share a secret with you? That's kind of hard. That's kind of hard. It's, it's hard to even be like Jesus with the people who sleep in your house, let alone with all the people that you run into on the street or at work. But in order for us to reach we have to change our mind and we have to change our heart and we have to change our actions so that people see Jesus in us. So I want to go back to the story from the beginning. I asked you what stuck, stuck out to you in that story. And here's the thing that stuck out to me. And the thing that bothers me about that story. It didn't seem to bother this town that this woman was unknown and uncared for. They didn't even have, know her name. They didn't even know her. This pastor, this church, he didn't know where she stood with Jesus. What struggles did she have in her life that she needed support and strength to overcome? What could have been done different to change the outcome of a story like this? I mean, apparently she was lost. Was there anyone that was seeking after her? I mean, she died in the garden of a church. She was obviously seeking something. Here's the thing. Maybe you're here today, and you're like this woman. You're lost, and you're seeking help. You don't really know why you're here, but you just felt like you're supposed to be here. You feel like you're naked and bare before God, but you don't know what to do next. I've got some good news for you. Jesus says this, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So you're here today for a reason. You're here today and all Jesus wants you to do 
is for you to acknowledge him for who he is. He wants you to acknowledge your need for him. He wants you to take a chance. He wants you to allow his spirit to move in you. And I want to challenge you to the same thing. I don't know where every one of you stands here this morning. But I know this. What I said earlier was true. Jesus came to die for sinners of who I am the worst. We all have sin. We all are broken. And we all need Jesus. I want to encourage you today. Take the first step. If you know you need Jesus, then take the first step and let us walk with you. And we'll reach out for Jesus together. Or maybe this morning you just have something that's aching in your heart and you don't know what to do and you just need someone to pray with you. We want to do that. Or maybe this morning you just simply need to come kneel at these steps or up here at these chairs and you just need to cry out to God because you're just not sure what's going on. Jesus loves us. He loves you. He took the first step and reached out to us. He reached like this and he reached like this. And he died so that we could come to him. This morning, if you have a need, if you have a desire, we want to invite you. Come down front. Myself, one of our other pastors and elders will be down front. We'd love to pray with you. Whatever your decision is, we want to invite you to come down front as we stand and as we sing.